special guests here. Wait, but we don't have any guests. Well, because <laughs> there aren't any young dealers in the antiques trade. I've been hearing it every day. It's um, true. We have antiques. We tried to really and I wanted to, to, to put together this um, event and we thought it would be fun to, because these are new antiquarians, to get some young dealers uh, on the stage. But um, we were told again and again that young people don't care about antiques. Um, in fact, not interested. In fact, I was at an Americana party the other day and I was introduced to someone whom I greatly admire, whom I'd never met before. You know, I know their work. And as soon as I was introduced, she looked at me with a withering glance. And I'm used to that when I'm being introduced. But this was particularly <laughs> withering. And she said, you must be one of those contemporary people. <laughs> because I'm young, which in the antiques trade means I'm below 60. <laughs> and I said, no, I've devoted my life to antiques. And actually, we did find three amazing young dealers who've devoted their lives to antiques to talk to us tonight. So we're going to start off with a, a young man who is the sign of a great old family firm here in New York, James Robinson, dealing in antique silver, uh, close to my heart, and antique jewelry. Uh, please welcome James Bonin. Second, we have our dear friend, Rhea Murray of Lillian Nassau. She's an exhibitor at the show, and we're so glad she can join us tonight. And last but not least, hailing from Kentucky, exhibiting at the Winter Show for the first time, Taylor Thistlefoot. All right, so we're going to take our seats but while we're going to begin with some storytelling and we're going to talk to you, we'll get to a more interactive conversation soon. So just know that you're gonna to have to listen to these people for a few minutes, but then we'll have a chat. They're only professional storytellers. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say a quick thank you to our sponsor for this episode, Freeman's Auction House. Uh, since 1805, Freemans has been a part of the fabric of Philadelphia, helping generations of clients in the buying and selling of fine and decorative arts, jewelry, modern design, and more. Freemans is now welcoming consignments for their Spring 2020 American Furniture Folk and Decorative Arts Auction. Visit freemansauction.com to request a complimentary, complimentary auction valuation and speak with their specialists. Now, we have five people on stage and we have five objects. And I think but a very good place to start is with the most menacing objects in the room. And uh, I think I probably don't need to tell you who brought the most menacing objects. <laughs> yes, you have some stash. Hello. Hello, thank you. Um, so I, uh, as well as dealing in antique silver and jewelry, I personally uh, enjoy antique arms and armor. Collecting uh, since I was about six, and the first item that was purchased for me, obviously at six I had no money, uh, was given to me by my grandfather, purchased here at the 1993 Winter Antique Show from Peter Feiner, one of the um, steadfast exhibitors here. Um, so I have brought a pair of um, Scottish Highland pistols, which um, are very unusual. They are unique to Scotland. They are normally completely made of metal, whether they're brass or steel, often highly engraved, and uh, usually just that is enough to make them of interest. Most weapons, pistols, flintlock, percussion, would have wood. But, um, and pardon me, I'm going to read from my phone because I have a story about these. So these pistols were owned by an, an English or Scottish man who was part of a, a platoon called the Black Watch. Um, and his name was Major Archibald Menzies, and um, he fought in the Battle of Cordobras, July, sorry, June 16th, 1815. Now this battle was one of the battles that led up to Waterloo. Um, the pistols themselves were made in the southeastern part of the Highlands in Scotland by a man named Thomas Murdoch, 
his family was very famous for making this style of uh, pistol. And uh, basically, a lot of these weapons were carried by Scottish military uh, officers, sorry, Scottish officers in the British military. Uh, and it was something that kind of distinguished them from English and Irish and uh, Welsh um, officers. And it was something that was very unique to them. So the story that I'm going to tell is uh, about actually the fight that um, Major Menzies found himself in. And this is actually from a book. Um, I have the reference at the end, but I'm not going to take the time to find it. Uh, this is a first-hand account of him fighting in this battle. Um, so it starts saying, Pre preferring to fight on foot in front of his men, he had given his horse to a drummer. After ser uh, severe fighting, he fell wounded next to Private Donald McIntosh. The drummer left the horse to assist his friend McIntosh. At this point, a French lancer attempted to seize the horse, at which uh, McIntosh exclaimed, and I'm not even going to try to read it in Scottish, no, no, not at all, uh, Hoot man, ye mauna take that beast, tit belongs to our captain here. Um, Just imagine that with a Scottish accent. <laughs> I had, a, I had um, Mr. Patrick read it earlier from uh, AOVR, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, he goes on to say, with a last expiring effort, loaded his musket and shot the lancer dead. A uh, French officer, seizing men's stirring, uh, seeing him stirring, rode up to attempt to dispatch him with a sword. As the Frenchman stopped from his saddle, Menzies seized his leg and managed to pull him off his horse and onto himself. Another lancer, observing the struggle, galloped up to attempt to spear Menzies and relieved his officer. But Menzies, by a sudden jerk and desperate exertion, placed the French officer uppermost, whereupon the Frenchman received the mortal thrust below his cuirass and rem remained as a shield for Menzies for the next ten minutes. A pause in the fighting enabled Menzies to be carried off to a relative safety of the square formed by the 92nd foot, whereupon it was discovered that he had endured no less than 16 stab wounds from lances and swords, most of which inflicted while he lay there on the ground wounded. So these pistols were carried with him at this battle, and uh, he was not actually present at the Battle of Waterloo, you might imagine due to his injuries, uh, but he was awarded uh, honors for bravery. And these were carried, or were in his family until, uh, I think, remembering the 60s when they were sold at auction. Um, his family had moved to New Zealand, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, and uh, then they've kind of circulated around. I found these at, again, Peter Finer here at the Winter Antique Show. Um, they kind of speak to me for many reasons, but particularly the engraving on them, the silver that is, of course, inlaid on them. But I found the story fascinating, uh, so much so that I forgot about it until yesterday. Um, but when I purchased them, I was very enthralled by the story, and many of the pieces I have, I don't have much of a story, but a date and a maker. Um, and I found these very interesting due to the, ex the extensive amount of information that are again, menacing objects, but uh, that's what drew me to it. Thanks for that very gory story, James. <laughs> I like to keep things lively. <laughs> should, should, should we move on to something a little, uh, a little more palatable? <laughs> How about a pig? Yeah, a little less menacing, perhaps. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> um, so, point to it. Yes, because he's a little in. diminutive. You may not notice him there, but... Um, on the table here, you'll see there's a little gold iridescent glass pig. Uh, so I work for Lillian Nassau LLC, which is one of the world's top dealers in the work of Louis Comfort Tiffany and Tiffany Studios, uh, which most people associate with the windows, leather glass windows and lamps, which are extremely famous. I mean, he's one of the most well-known American uh, decorative artists. But he also uh, had a big complex out in Corona, Queens, where they did a lot of blown glass. So if you visit our booth here at the show, which is 8-2, uh, you will see the firm's signature leaded glass lamps, but you will also see a cabinet on the left side that is full of a variety of objects that they produced out in Corona, Queens. Uh, so there's a lot of art glass vases, there's a lot of really ornate decorative finishes on them. 
there's picture frames, desk set pieces. At the time, you would have had a really elaborate desk covered with blotters and things like that. Um, so they made art glass, which was really quite expensive for them to produce. They spent a lot of money out in this Corona Queens factory. Tiffany brought in artisans from Europe in the 1890s, uh, people who were experts in the field in Europe, and they did a lot of experimentation to produce this really elaborate art glass that would sell for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, but the other thing that they produced was a lot of more commercial tableware, and that's the gold iridescent glass that a lot of people are more familiar with today. Uh, it's really, really beautiful, lustrous finish. Um, actually, the man who apparently invented this, a lot of people just assume that Tiffany, and he encouraged this assumption very much, uh, they assumed that he was actually in Corona blowing the glass, that he was in the furnaces, that he was designing the lamps, and that was the impression that was given for a long time deliberately in their advertising. Um, but in the last 30 years or so, thanks to a lot of scholarship from really incredible curators and um, private researchers, we found out that these objects were created by average people. Uh, the lamps, which he's the most famous for, were designed by a group of women. Uh, and then the glass pieces were produced by, uh, I think it was about 150 men at the peak of employment in Corona, Queens. Uh, and so this little object here on the table, it's, it's very unusual. It's not what you would expect to see in a piece of Tiffany Gold iridescent glass. And that's because it's not really an officially sanctioned piece of Tiffany glass. Uh, Arlie Sulpa, the owner of the gallery, was contacted by the descendants of somebody who actually worked at Tiffany Studios. The family was still uh, in the New York City area. And they had a whole bunch of pieces that this descendant had taken home with him when the company closed in the early 1930s. And this little piggy was one of the many pieces that they brought to us. And they were strange things that would not have been sold. They were actually bottles that were marked and engraved sample A.H. Nash. He was the man that invented the gold iridescent glass finish. Um, and so it's, it's an unusual piece. It's something that if I think Louis Tiffany knew that I was here today talking about in the, in the, in the armory, he might be a little upset. Uh, because he, he definitely wanted to be seen as the auteur behind everything. Um, Unfortunately, he's buried all the way over his Yes, life. he's all the way out in Greenwood Cemetery. He has no idea that we're here today. Um, so this is a really, it's an unusual piece, and it's an exciting insight into the people behind the scenes who are really, you know, making all these spectacular objects that we're all lusting over today. Um, so. And you've called this piece a whimsy. Yes, it's there, are a others, there are other whimsies, right? What form did they take? So whimsy is it's sort of a glass blowing term. It's something that we use to refer to things that were made kind of in your own free time after hours. Oh, off, right. Uh, and actually, while I was doing a little research to get ready for this, I ended up um, looking at the Corning Museum of Glass. I think about thirty years or so. Uh, they were able to acquire from auction the actual notebooks of the man, Arthur Nash, who invented all of this glass. He was like incredibly secretive. The notebooks literally have a lock on them, and he carried them around with him every day. He wouldn't let anybody into his laboratory, like nothing like that. So he would literally mix all of the elements to create a, a batch of glass in his locked laboratory and then bring them out to the glass blowers because they actually had recorded incidents of people trying to steal their formulas because the gold iridescent glass when Tiffany invented this was like a huge popular thing. People were going crazy over it. And a lot of the other companies were trying to steal that formula. So while I was doing this research, I sort of dredged up some scans that I had for this talk of the actual Nash notebooks. And you have to sort of take them with a grain of salt because they're written by both Arthur and his son, who was later employed by Tiffany. Um, they were a little bit bitter about their relationship with Tiffany. There were some choice comments about Louis through, you know, Pepper throughout the pages. Um, but there were also a lot of really fascinating stories about just day-to-day -day working at Tiffany Studios. And so Nash makes reference to something that he calls the glass parade. Uh, Leslie, the son, makes a reference to this. And so apparently there was one day where, for whatever reason, some one of the old gaffers told him some story about 
they, all the glass blowers, like spent an hour a day making a curious, well, a curious object, really, uh, to sort of show off their skills, yeah. And so Nash then decided, well, let's do that again, like something to keep up the morale. So he gave them each an hour a day for a few weeks to work on their own object. And he sketched the ones that he remembered, and he called it the glass parade of all these. There was a whole set of instruments. They had a whole glass band. They had a flag, you know, ripple, rippling in the wind. There were all these sort of funky little things that were just objects that they made to kind of play around and show off how much technique they had. So this is an example of that, a whimsy, something that they were just kind of playing around with. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> well, Taylor, what you're going to talk to us about is not exactly a whimsy. There may be some whimsical carving on it. Tell us about it. Uh, there, there certainly is some whimsical carving on it. And uh, the funny thing about it is, you know, we, we talk about Scottish pistols and epic battles, and we talk about great New York institution of Tiffany. And my piece might have a little bit of both mixed in. So uh, I brought today a great uh, New York card table. And uh, let me start by saying I am a first-time exhibitor here, and I found out I got in the show about six months ago. So when you find out you're in the winter show, you go, this is great, this is so exciting, oh my god, what am I going to bring? <laughs> and uh, I, I was doing some research and found out about a great New York card table. And uh, it's one of these things when you, you walk into a room as an antique guy and you sit and you go, oh my god, this is great. Um, and I was especially excited by this one because out of all the New York furniture that was ever made, I think the card table is the most attractive form. It is, it has curves everywhere, big droning, very bold ball claw feet. And uh, this one is very special because it's in the original surface with great, you know, just, it, it, it's what us antique dealers, or us brown wood people, just melt for. Um, and I, uh, when you get the, and I was lucky enough to get the piece, but then we started looking into it. And the uh, table is signed on the underside of the top as well as the top of the frame of the Lot. And the Lot family in the 18th century was one of the largest landowners in Brooklyn. And uh, of course, the dealer here, Frank Levy, has done more research on these tables than any human on earth. So I have to give him so much credit for helping me dig into this uh, table. And the podcast. Uh, the, he, he's already a superstar, of course. Uh, and um, when we got to looking into Lot, the, these tables have always been attributed to a partnership that was started in 1765 and lasted to 1775. And it was uh, by Willett and Piercy. And Willett marries Piercy's daughter, so we've got some good connections there. And um, this is where we get into the war part. So when Willett, you know, we had these 10 year period where these tables were being produced. Again, they're over the top. We have attributed them to some of the best families in New York. And Lot and Willett actually have some interconnections. So it makes perfect sense that this uh, table belonged to the Lot family. Well, Willett, interesting enough, war comes along and he's like, well, time to stop being a cabinet maker. And it goes on to be a huge Revolutionary War figure. It is involved in several battles and eventually, you know, comes back and becomes mayor of New York and, uh, you know, also the vice governor of New York. So, I, I think you go from cabinet making to politics, it, it, it might be a little a simple job here. Is that in your future? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, probably 2040, somewhere there. <laughs> Revere, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. you, silver guys. Yeah. Plenty of precedent. Absolutely. So this is just a uh, this is a great example of not only great New York craftsmanship, but just uh, a, a great thing that just came together for me at the right time. And as all antique dealers know, that's like the most exciting thing ever is when 
something, a great story, a great piece just kind of falls into your lap, and then you like trace out all these little threads and go, oh my god, this looks so cool. <laughs> and we um, don't have a picture of it, actually, because you had another object in mind that and a big collector came by and decided he was interested in this. Yeah, story. so I, you know, I, I had a great weather rag that was going to make an appearance. He was a pretty dog to go away with a pig. And, <laughs> and then, then I, uh, a friend who's helping me at the booth called and was like, we have somebody here who's here to look at the dog. So the dog and I would beeline back to the booth. So uh, The dog was here, guys, yeah. just a few minutes ago. <laughs> I really think this has to be understood to know what the winter show is all about. Material may be of museum quality, but it's a buying fair, and I just, I love that about it. This guy might be on his way out of the door right now. A a absolutely. Let let's hope he finds a good home, because he's a good boy. <laughs> Michael, speaking of buying, you brought an object that uh, you bought yourself just very recently. It's true. I just got this fellow on my lapel, and I don't know a whole lot about him yet, because he's recently adopted. Uh, he may appear on that screen, but I want to lodge a disclaimer with you. He's not from the Winter Show. Apologies to Helen and to my fellow Winter Show committee members. I'm 33, and he's from eBay. <laughs> but I spoke to Ali Shushin, the foremost authority on portrait miniatures in America, who is a loyal Winter Show exhibitor, and she has said that I did good. And considering how much I paid for him, I pretty much had to do good, because I didn't pay a lot. So that's the money side of things, and I think it's important to remember that historic objects, examples of material culture from the past, can be bought at every price point imaginable. And so, you know, this is an example of that. Um, I was attracted to this gentleman who feels to me like a bit of a dandy, and also to the kind of neoclassical simplicity of his, uh, you know, the background and the frame, and what's not evident from the image that you see on the screen as, is that um, this is a portrait miniature configured as a morning brooch. So there's also um, a set of initials here rendered in human hair, which some might find a little bit creepy. I think of it as a locus for stories, and that's what we care about here. There's no glass on the back yet. I still have to have it restored, so I'm going to very carefully turn it around. Um, and, you know, I love the way it looks. I love the fact that this person mattered to someone. I don't know who he is yet. I don't know who wore the morning brooch but I know that there was an intense, passionate attachment at the root of this object. And it's yet to be discovered, but based on what I've heard up here today, there's hope that I'll be able to uncover that story and, and maybe be inspired by it instead of seeing it as creepy that I'm wearing human hair on my lapel. Um, and that's pretty much it for this guy. I neglected to say that we think he is broadly of the German school and from 1785, 1790, which is about what I figured based on his costume. But further evidence may prove me wrong, and I'll give you an update if I find out that I am wrong. You'll hear about it on Curious Objects. Yes. Um, I am going to have to get up to talk about this object, um, <clears throat> which uh, I'm afraid I've, I've deceived you all. Um, podcast listeners um, won't uh, be aware of this, but what I have in front of me is a oversized chocolate pot. Uh, however, that is not the object that I wanted to talk to you about today. The object is actually inside the chocolate pot. Give me a second here. Here we go. So, <clears throat> this is a piece uh, which I should start by telling you was um, miscatalogued in an auction sale by a professional in the antiques auction business as a mace. <laughs> you can perhaps imagine why. <laughs> and the reason.
reason that someone who actually was quite experienced and knowledgeable miscataloged it is that this is a vanishingly rare object. It's a piece that um, made in sterling silver in the early 18th century in England. And the thing about silver is it is money, right? And it can be turned from useful objects into coins, and it can be sold as a raw material. So it's a liquid asset. And when a piece of silver becomes obsolete, out of fashion, unusable, when you lose your interest in it, you always have the option of sending it to the melting pot and melting it down. Well, this object is what's called a mullinet. And its original function was to stir a pot of chocolate. And uh, it's a function that was very important in the 18th century when chocolate was a, a vogue beverage in England and it started coming up from Spain, where it had come from Mesoamerica. And the problem was that it was a very fatty beverage. So if you were to pour it straight out of the pot, you would end up with this nasty, oily film on the top that wasn't very pleasant to drink. So right before serving it, the chocolate needed to be whipped up. So this is, uh, we call it a mullet, but you could also call it a swizzle stick. <laughs> Most of these were made in wood. Um, some of them were made in brass and other materials because they were hidden inside the pot. Most people wouldn't see them. So most people didn't bother spending a lot of money to make them out of fancy materials like silver. But in a few rare ca cases, some very fancy people decided that nothing but silver would do. So there were a certain number of silver monuments made. Now, in the 19th century, when chocolate production changed, and they came up with better emulsifiers, and didn't need to whip the chocolate right before serving anymore. The mullinets became obsolete objects. So the vast majority of the ones that had been made in silver, which was already a small number, were melted down and turned into coins or turned into coffee pots or other things. And so they were largely forgotten. And today, it's once in a very long while that one of these turns up on the market. There are a tiny handful in museums in various places. There are a tiny handful in private collections, and there's this one which happens to be in the inventory of S.J. Trussell, my employer. Um, so I was very happy to be able to bring it today and show that even a useless object that hasn't had a proper function in 200 plus years now is nevertheless has been treasured enough through the generations not to be turned into liquid cash or a retirement fund, um, and therefore to have survived to uh, be seen by all of us here today. Brilliant. Almost looks like a center. You can just stand there and uh, listen. Uh, as a torture device. <laughs> Speaking of gory stories. We probably don't need to follow that line. Let's, let's just leave that where it is. I, I just want to look at, to consider one thing quickly before we move into a broader conversation. We were, we were joking about how People say there aren't many young people who like antiques, and this audience and these panelists are proof against that. But I'm so fa I, as I was sitting here, I was realizing that James emerges from a family firm, and that's a very traditional way to get into the antiques trade. So he represents one route into the trade. Ria, you've been mentored by Arlie Solka, who was mentored by Lillian Nassau. So you're part of a, almost a matriarchal lineage. Yes, we definitely have. Experts. And, and Tiffany, I mean, Lillian Nassau practically invented the field. She is. You're a direct descendant. Widely considered the doyen, or was widely considered to be the doyen of Tiffany. Yeah, yeah. and so there's a kind of, it, it's not a family firm, but there's a tradition there of mentorship that takes Lillian Nassau's knowledge and expertise, delivers it to Arlie Silka, who delivers it to Ria in this really glorious and direct line. And here we have Taylor, the youngest or second youngest, maybe exhibitor to Into the Winter Show ever. And I'm very proud to be, I, I think so. I'm not talking about a deputy or an assistant, you know, in a gallery, but an exhibiting uh, participant close to the youngest, and certainly in the last few decades. And you're starting your business yourself. I mean, you did start your business yourself. It's not, it wasn't inherited. And that represents another route into the trade. So we have three young people 
but they're distinguished by these very distinct means of entry into the antiques trade. And I think Ben has another way of entering the trade that you've heard about at a bar. Well, yeah, hold up story through sheer coincidence. Yeah. Um, and uh, fortune or misfortune, depending on how you see it. I just wanted to point that out. There's a sort of yeah. diversity here that's really interesting to me. And this is only among dealers, of course. You know, there's a whole other world of scholars and curators precisely working outside of the trade. Exactly. Yeah. I want to say uh, share another quick word from our generous sponsor, Freeman's Auction House, who are excited to announce Warden Ashwick, made for the stage. This is a historic collection of woodwork by one of America's most important woodworkers from the Hedra Theater Collection in Rose Valley, Pennsylvania. Coming to auction on March 31st, Martha Gallons. The sale includes the legendary Thunder Table from 1929, and the earliest chairs uh, made from repurposed axe and hammer handles by the artist. Established in 1923 in the Rose Valley Arts and Crafts Community, Hedro Theater is America's longest serving repertory theater. The works from the collection represent the indelible influence of the performing arts on Ashrake widely regarded as one of the most significant studio woodworkers of the 20th century. Thank you to Freemans. We love you. <laughs> now, I want to continue the conversation. We, you know, we've heard these stories, but let's, let's dig a little deeper into these objects and into our experiences about them. And the first thing that I want to ask you, James, um, you brought a pair of pistols into this room. Probably not the first, frankly. <laughs> is the, the firearms are regulated in this state? Um, how how does that work? So uh, you need a license for uh, firearms that date post eighteen ninety. Thank you. Um, so basically, when bullets and cartridges cartridges and uh, firing pins became the method of fire. Um, there's actually no law against walking down the street with a pair of flintlocks, maybe loaded, I don't know. Um, but uh, yes, anything that is a, uh, a firearm made before 1890 um, can be bought with no license. It uh, doesn't matter if they operate or not. Um, if you, for items made after it, they need to be uh, decommissioned, right? They'd have to be like uh, bolted or removed. Yeah, or it would have to be, um, you know, go through an FFA. Right, exactly. So, um, I actually, well, this is the thing that's, that's interesting, is that I, I have had this discussion many times with friends or other dealers. Um, most of the objects, most of the, obviously, arms and armor that I collect actually are more decorative. Um, I do have about 25 objects. Most of them, um, as I said, these pistols being very unusual, being made of metal. Most of them have wood grips, wood hand um, stocks, uh, silver inlay, gold inlay, uh, usually highly engraved. Um, one of my favorite is a, uh, it's a single flintlock pistol from Naples, Italy. It's a very beautiful brindled wood with gold and silver inlay, um, a lion's head um, on the butt. Um, everything about it was made for someone to show off. And that's actually one thing when you talk to Peter Finers, um, Red and, and Peter and Rowley, um, when you get to a certain point of time, they're you know, useful in the evil and whatnot, but most of their later objects were made to be showpieces. Um, I'm not really interested generally in having actually just a plain object, you know, rifle with nothing on it or a sword that was literally just made for, for killing, if I'm being completely honest. Um, the sword that I have, the two swords I have were both court swords. They were worn for dress. They were often worn with, you know, frilly wigs and, you know, like Michael's um, a miniature, like that gentleman would have likely at court had a sword on his, on his yeah. waist. I mean, in that sense, it's not so different from the jewelry that you grew up around in the family business, right? Absolutely. So, um, as Michael had mentioned, I'm fifth generation in my family. Uh, we opened in 1912. And um, recently, in the last 30, 40 years, we've, we've become a big part in jewelry. Uh, before, actually, we were uh, shrub, uh, Estre Shrub Silver. We were primarily silver uh, dealers. But, um, yeah, these things were ornamental. Exotic leather, not just regular leather, often with. 
needed the silver or jewels. Um, actually, in France only, the royal family was allowed to have jewels, and often other people would use things like marcasite and enamel, which was allowed, and they would have these highly elaborate gold and enamel swords because they were literally like wearing a necklace for a woman or a brooch or whatever they wore at the time. Yeah, and the, and the techniques used to produce that decoration were similar or the same. At the the event, event. Actually, one of the most beautiful objects in the arms and armor wing, which I think most people don't really go to because they think of weapons, there's a outstandingly gorgeous um, hilt, which is the handle and um, guard of a sword, and it was made by um, Alexis Feliz and another man. And I forget his name, but great it's a French jeweler. Jeweler, great French jeweler, sorry. And the handle, the grip, is a woman reaching up top of the, uh, the butt, the pummel, is her face, and the, um, the, the guard is all what I remember off the top of my head, almost like angels, and it's a very spiritual, religious piece. Um, there's, no, there's no blade on it, but the key is the person that would have carried this, this would have been a highly expensive, highly decorative piece of jewelry, but it just would have been worn on a man's belt as if yeah, so it speaks to gender in a complexifying way. We're not just looking at valor, you know, objects that valorize warfare or a certain kind of masculinity. They can actually cause us to think about it critically, which I think is not necessarily what people expect when they look at two pistols. Yeah, and I think that's the key is that these, yes, these ones were made to be used. Um, they probably were, but at the same time, they were also a very large sense of national pride for Scottish officers that were, whether you're English or Scottish, they feel a great sense of uh, national pride, uh, being completely different and independent in their in their history and their in their heritage. And this was something that set them apart from their contemporaries within the within the service. Ria, there's only so much that we can know about a piece that's not um, uh, documented where we don't have a letter entry, where we don't have provenance. But I want to ask you to speculate a little, because you do know a little bit about the workshops and the, yes. the circumstances. So what do you think was going through the mind of the person involved in, in producing this? Well, I started to wonder because when this first came into the store, this is actually the second time that we've owned this pig. It first came to us in the collection of, I know it's weird to say, owned this pig. No, uh, I love it. <laughs> Uh, but the first time it came to us was in the collection of this family, and we actually sold it. And then the person we sold it to unfortunately passed away, and so it has now come back to us. Um, and the first time we had it, I heard tell from Lindsay Parrott, who you guys may know, she's the uh, executive director and the curator of the Newstack collection of Tiffany Glass, which is a really incredible resource. Uh, it's out in Long Island City in Queens. Um, and so it's, it's a study collection. There was this orthodontist from Queens who was very passionate about Tiffany. There's going to be a future New Antiquarians tour of their facilities. That there yeah. be, because it's, we had a great time there celebrating Louie's birthday a few years ago. I mean, if you have never been, they do offer tours. I guess we'll have an event for New Antiquarians, which will be really fun. But anyway, I digress. Lindsay is an incredible scholar and a really wonderful person, and she had mentioned to me a few years ago that there was another pig out there, and so I said, okay. And she came by the booth the other day, and I asked her about it, and she had actually borrowed from the descendants of a different family of a Tiffany worker a collection of these whimsies, and there was another pig. This pig that we have, I think he's like three inches, maybe by two inches, he's quite small. The other pig is about the size, I mean, he's about 12 inches, maybe four inches high, he's quite big, and he's blown in a completely different method. This one is blown from the snout, and then they sort of pulled it up through the tail. The other one was blown from the tail, and they pinched his nose out. So it's just sort of like, a, why are there two pigs? Why are they so different? Why are the methods of construction so different? When I found out about this glass parade where they made all these musical instruments, I couldn't help but wonder maybe they had a day where they decided to make pigs for fun and see who could make the best pig, you know? Uh, they're the only two pigs that we know. There really aren't very many Tiffany glass whimsies that exist out there in the world. I think part of it's probably because the Nashes were so protective about their formula, so there wasn't really a lot of extra material around for people to sort of play with in their free time. 
we know from the diary that they only got to make the glass parade stuff because he sort of relented and allowed them to have a little fun. So I, I, I wish I knew exactly how or why this was made. I mean, we do know that it went into the family, and we can tell from the condition of it that it's had an interesting life. Uh, the four little legs that are on the bottom, the way that they were put on was they were applied while they were hot, so the, liquid, the glass would actually pool and fuse with the body of the pig. I don't know if you can see it in the picture very well. Um, and the same thing with the little ears. They were sort of plopped on while it was hot and then pinched so that they would get that shape. Um, so we have found out after the fact that four, three of the four legs have been reattached with and I will say one of them is not done very well. There's a lot of visible glue. But again, this was not like a Tiffany vase. It's not a morning glory vase. It sells for, you know, a lot, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, so they weren't trying to repair this in a way to, you know, maintain the value. It could have just been, you know, this guy's kids were playing with it for fun and they broke the feet off and somebody just glued them back on. And, and broadly speaking, it would it could constitute a kind of accessible object that you might begin a collection with because yes, of that. Right? Absolutely, I think so. I mean, Tiffany, you know, uh, as young dealers, and also I think we're all young collectors as well. Um, Tiffany can seem very out of reach to us. I think we know that lamps can sell for millions of dollars. Uh, the vases can sell for tens of thousands of dollars. But these pieces of more sort of unusual sort of the cultural objects, the material objects that the firm was making, those definitely are much more attainable to people of our uh, buying power, I guess I'll say. So, so speaking of people of our buying power, there's a lot of discussion, as we've already discussed, about the ways that young people are involved in the antiques trade and antiques collecting, and I think that synthesizing all of those discussions, one of the things we know is that the new generation of enthusiasts and dealers and curators will provide a new spin on things. So, for example, thinking about the chocolate pot, there's a lot of research being done now on food ways and on the material culture of food. So we're not just looking at this as a masterpiece of silver, we're looking at it through the context of the food ways that it was produced to serve, right? And I think that whether we look at the decorative qualities of the pistols or at a whimsy instead of at a lamp or a vase, we're kind of looking at, at these objects in a slightly oblique way that constitute your contribution to discourse on curious objects. So Taylor, I want to look at this table through that lens. And while doing that, I'd also like to think about your booth at the Winter Show, which represents a cross-collecting perspective. Um, well, at the Winter Show, I was finally able to do a booth that I've always wanted to do. And um, I wanted to do 200 years of American design. Of course, uh, for you Victorians and Tiffany people, I kind of glanced past that area a little bit. Um, yeah, I love that a lot. But, uh, you know, when I started out in this business, I, I, my mentor was a gentleman named Bob. A former Winter Show dealer named Sumter Pretty. And actually, a, a person who worked with me there is in the audience today, and she's now at the vet. So, hey, we can all go different places starting in this world. But, um, you know, when I came upon these objects, you know, if we look at, let's say, the work of Willett and Pierce here, we get these dramatic Rococo influenced lines, and I, I, I use the term sexy legs because. In my mind, yes, those are very sexy balls and balls. It, it just has so much going on. But then... Shouldn't those be covered? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the 18th century here. But um, we then go on in the future. Let's fast forward 200 years. What do we see? We see people like Paul Evans, who comes up with the most fascinating, brutalist furniture. And why not set that right next to my sexy table, you know? Uh, it, it, it's, if you look at the lens of American design, we've been producing great things for 200 years. There's no time limit on any of this stuff. And, you know, just because I personally prefer, you know, 18th century furniture, that doesn't mean that I can't appreciate, 
you have a Paul Evans disc bar, which is this big disc, and you open it up, and hey, it's a bar. Um, but I, I think it's important, as young collectors, I find that people aren't tracing things as much as they used to in, well, I have to own every one of these groups, or I bought a period of home, we have to fill up full of period furniture. Why don't we have fun with it? I mean, why should we limit ourselves? And uh, I think, you know, with young collectors, more so than our generation's past, we care about great design. It's not that people in our generation, and I, I hope you all expand on this, don't care about this stuff. It's just, I don't think we like to be limited, you know? Uh, we didn't grow up of having the, what, 24 photographs that we can take in a camera or whatever. We can take millions of photographs, so, you know, why limit ourselves? Why close things down? And, uh, yeah, and I, I, I think it's important, you know, one interesting thing about the way that all of us here are talking about our objects is that um, we are, I think all five of us are uh, in one degree or, or another connoisseurs. But that doesn't mean that we are focusing on the um, minute details of the design. Maybe we're interested in those minute details, but that's not the starting place. You know, the starting place when you look at a pair of pistols like that is, what's the story? Who's the person behind it? What battle was he in and what happened to him there? I mean, that's, that's incredible. It brings life to the objects. For me, you know, thinking about the, the Molinet, you know, it's an interesting work of, of silversmithing and it's a rarity. But more interesting to me than all of that is the story that it has to tell about dining customs, but also about globalization and transatlantic trade and about the economy and um, saving and investing and the ways that people have thought about their assets over time. You know, you can link these objects to so many different elements of history, of society, of culture, of anthropology, of psychology. And that is all relevant today as much as it ever has been throughout the lives of these objects. Um, so I think, uh, you know, for, for many modern collectors, you know, those are the, the elements that really get us excited about these things. So what can they tell us about the people before us, and what can they tell us about ourselves? And if, and if I've just bought a 17th century house, and I happen to want a Paul Evans this far to go in it, oh my god, I'll just do it. If you're more and than I'll than also buy some 17th century furniture. You know, uh, tomorrow night I was actually planning on playing cards on my card table, so if you all come by for your young collector's night, maybe oh, yeah. uh, we will have a jolly good time. And we can have a live vignette. I think one thing that you did that's brilliant, though, is that so many people of our generation, as you mentioned, the generation before would fill their 17th century house or 18th century house with the, the like furniture, but I think people don't realize that the mid-century or the or the early American can all kind of work together. Maybe not every piece with every piece, but the styles are completely able to go across, and that's something that I, I do in my own home, but, you know, obviously. Well, I, I think as antique dealers and antiquarians and everything, across the board, I think we recognize quality when we see it. Um, I think most of us have owned IKEA furniture in our lifetime. Still do. And it's great, but you know what? <laughs> if we can see great pieces or great things, why not own them? I, I want to open up the floor to some, some audience questions, if there are any. Um, raise your hand if Kat has a mic here. She'll, she'll bring it to you. Oh. Sorry, James. No more talk. Um, so raise your hand, I uh, can't find you. Uh, Hi, Eve. Hi, everyone. Thank you. That was rivetingly fascinating. I have one Antiques Roadshow question. None of you have talked about the value of the piece. Retail, insurance, you, you tell me. Well, some people would say that's gauche. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a... Uh, 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 an important starting place for almost any collector is to think about uh, what is a reasonable sum for you to pay for something, uh, what's a feasible sum for you to pay for something. Um, I think 
Michael, uh, your story about your object is a, it's a great starting point. I'm at the low end over here. <laughs> I apologize. Um, yeah, this cost $200. And I could sell it for more. So, you know, in that sense, from an investment standpoint, it was a successful investment of $200 that might have otherwise gone to decadent cocktails in the Lower East Side. I mean, when my, my curator and critic friends are sort of judging me for being involved in the decorative arts, you know, I remind them, you were in the Maldives last week in a luxury modernist villa that definitely cost at least a few thousand dollars a night. My late Baroque chair that I got on the side of the road is not as implicated in problematic labor practices <laughs> as your villa in the Maldives, okay? I don't care if you're a curator at MoMA. So, yeah, I think that it's a great example of a starting point. And the, the winter show has one of the world's most stringent vetting processes. So, you know, something to note is that anything that's been on the show floor was vetted by experts for authenticity, date, and condition. But that doesn't make everything on the show floor heinously expensive. So, you know, if this is a show that has, that's full of masterpieces and museum quality works, but there are things like the Whimsy, for example, that are more accessible. And there is transparent pricing um, in our ethos. So, you can know how much these things cost. Yes, so, I mean, the painting, for example, we sort of briefly touched on it, but uh, the cabinet in our booth full of Tiffany glass, there is quite a range of pricing in terms of what is available. Um, we do have some really spectacular, rare examples of the art glass. Uh, these are paperweight vases, it's a technique that Tiffany pioneered. Uh, those, some of them are $45,000. We've had vases that are over $100,000. But we always make sure when we come to a show like the Winter Show that we bring a range of objects because we know that this show attracts a whole, you know, a complete range of buyers, people who are just starting out who know this is a great place to train your eye. Um, people who have been collecting for years who know that there is a vetting process here that will, you know, enable you to feel comfortable about purchasing something that you may not necessarily have the experience in collecting outside of a category you're not comfortable with. Um, so we try and incorporate that sort of into our booth. So we have the $45,000 vase, but we also have a cabinet vase that is under $1,000. There's, there's quite a, a range of options. And, well, and, and James got his pistols uh, at age six, so they couldn't have been that expensive. Uh, when I started collecting, yeah, I think the first, um, it's called a muff pistol, uh, which has a highly detailed silver inlay on the handle. I think it cost about $200. They have now gone up in price since then. Um, but that was then. Um, I also will, will say that unfairly, since I've known them since I was five, they do give me a very good um, <laughs> uh, number. So I, I would probably say that the insurance, if, you, if you'd like to know, is probably close to $16,000, but I didn't pay any. Um, but go ahead. I, I think most dealers at the show will also honor a uh, Curious Objects listener. Yes, discount. of course they all do. Just <laughs> mention that. And, and Taylor, your Curious Object is possibly not quite as accessible, but I can give you great references. So. <laughs> yes, and, and but wood furniture. I'm not going to say brown furniture because I almost lost my life a few years ago when I said that live on a tour of the Winter Show, and people were very mad at me, even though I didn't mean it in a uh, pejorative way. Wood furniture is incredibly accessible right now. I mean, everybody should go out and buy wood furniture and stockpile it and fill your homes with it because it's never been as accessible. Absolutely, and you know, for the beginning collector, you can buy great, you know, American chest of drawers for a very reasonable price. Um, this isn't that reasonable. Uh, it, 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 this table is kind of a one in a lifetime opportunity. But I will say at Sotheby's and Christie's, it has tripled and quadrupled uh, in price and examples very similar to this. Um, I'm asking 285000 for the table. But, you know. And you just carried it over here willy nilly from the back. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I have 
have to say when you live with this stuff, you have a lot more fun. I ate dinner at it one night too, which, uh, you know, most people would cringe at that, but I'm like, I thought, if, you know, it's in my living room, said, why not? This yeah. is actually one thing not to put down museums, but that's actually one thing that I find very interesting is that we live with these items, we use them. I mean, I drink out of silver sometimes for fun. I was at Trucksell the other day, and you were drinking water out of an antique silver mug, um, because we can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the key is environmentally friendly. Uh, uh, antiques are green, um, but the whole key is, is that uh, I was talking with another dealer, and, and even though, of course, museums spend a lot of money to uh, restore and protect, and they're very important to our society, the thing that's always very interesting is sometimes when you have these objects and they pass over to a museum, they become white glove objects, but yet we deal with them every day, and we take care of them just as well, and we care for them just as much, but... Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting, you know, as a, as a collector, um, Michael, you talked about um, weekending in the Maldives, um, I think we can all relate. And this <laughs> is the best, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's the next top dog for people. But, um, you know, there's this idea, and I'm a broken record player. You've heard me talk about this on the podcast before. Um, but there's this idea that uh, younger generations in this country are interested really in experiences rather than objects. And I just want to turn that concept on its head because I think it's true. I also think that if you're investing in right objects, that those objects are experiences that you can have every day of your life. Yes. And it's an experience that only grows in power and importance and emotional impact with every time that you use it. So if your trade-off is a fun night of cocktails versus uh, buying a nice pewter tankard, that you can take home and fill with cocktails or something else and drink out of that for the next 10 years, 30 years, 50 years. Um, that seems, in some cases, to me like a very reasonable trade off. Yeah, and we don't have to use the objects for the function they were designed to serve. Maybe with a hot chocolate pot, we should. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, it's January. Let's do this. Just as long as we don't have to use a 15th century chocolate recipe. I think there's some Swiss Miss in the dealer's <laughs> Well, Swiss Miss, and we also have a Mexican in the audience who I think has some ideas about how chocolate should have been prepared in the 18th century that maybe, you know, weren't so current in the colonies in America. Um, but I'm thinking about um, a party I went to about a year ago on the Lower East Side where a young antiquarian who is involved in Young Collectors Night will be here tomorrow, had set out a silver Monteith or a Turin sort of object. I can't remember quite which. For shame. For shame, I know. I mean, the night was a blur because some cocktails were consumed. But it had, it was, it was full of ice and it was full of beers and wine and the room was candlelit and there were Imari plates glistening on the walls and this was the apartment of a very young and I think it was just so charming that they had put beers in, let's call it a Monteith. Let's, that, that's the most fun configuration of this juxtaposition. And we're, we're treating the material with respect. It was in a, a you know, place of pride in their home, center stage of this party, but they were using it to serve a function that made sense in their lives in the 21st century. And I think that's great, and I think we have to be able to think creatively about how we use these things so they can be a part of our lives and not just, you know, museum pieces. Do, do we have more uh, questions, Ben? We've only taken about 20 minutes to answer the first one. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> Anyone else? No more burning curiosity. Well, well, we're going to have a, a wine reception now. And so if you develop any questions over wine, feel free to ask us or our brilliant panelists who will have much more to say if you just poke them. And do you know where to find many of these objects from the show floor if you have the chance to visit? So um, a huge thank you. <laughs>